Hello and welcome to the second HPS presentation series webinar. This follows from January's webinar on surgery and anaesthesia, through which we heard from three great partnerships delivering projects in Gaza, Uganda and Ghana. Uh, today our focus is on health partnerships working in Uganda. You should be able to see our screen and you are all currently on mute so we are not able to hear you. We'd like to reassure you that the PowerPoint presentation and the recording will be available after today and we intend to post the recording on our YouTube channel. So in case you have any problems with connectivity or in seeing the slides, it will all be available afterwards. We will have some time for questions at the end, hopefully. Um, but in the meantime, if you'd like to let us know of any problems with the audio, please let us know through the typed question box and we will try to address the problem. So I am Pippa Williams, a Grants Officer at THET. Um, we are here to introduce today's presentations um, and to ensure, hopefully, that the technical side of things runs smoothly. There are many fantastic projects being implemented across Uganda with 24 health partnership projects operating within the health partnership scheme alone. Health partnerships are playing an important role in delivering essential training to health workers across the country within the areas of child health, maternal and newborn health, sexual and reproductive health, eye health, mental health, non-communicable diseases, palliative health and patient safety. Today we'll be hearing about the work of four very different partnerships that we think excellently demonstrate the value of this work. Um, and will hopefully allow for shared learning amongst those working in Uganda and those further afield. I'd now like to introduce the first session for today, which will be delivered by Kim Parker, a senior nurse at the Sheffield Health and Social Care NHS Foundation Trust. Kim is a UK clinical lead for the respectful management of violence and aggression training in Gulu Regional Referral Hospital and surrounding districts. Um, the project is implemented in collaboration with the Gulu Regional Referral Hospital. So I will now hand you over to, to Kim. Hello. Hi Kim, um, so we can hear you, so I'll hand over to you. Okay, can you see the screen? Yep we, yep, we can see your screen. All good to go. Okay, hello everyone. Um, as Pippa said, my name is Kim Parker and I'm with Greg Harrison, who is the project coordinator, the partnership coordinator. Um, we work on this together. So we're going to talk today about um, the, the Gulu Sheffield Mental Health Partnership and more specifically the work that we're currently involved in, which has been recently supported by a FET grant. In 2012, we received a startup grant from FET, which enabled us from Sheffield Health and Social Care to make an initial visit to Gulo to scope out possibilities for starting and developing a health link. And we did develop that health link in 2012, and we've now got four established work streams, which are uh, the Commonwealth Fellowship Scheme. A patient safety focus within the mental health unit, work with Mental Health Uganda, uh, the Gulu branch, which is a service user group, and most recently the respect training that was enabled by um, the FET award. So a little bit of detail about those particular work streams. Um, in 2012 we met with the hospital director at the time and through discussions with him and the broader team we initiated um, a, a health partnership with a patient safety focus. That was the area that the hospital identified that they wanted to work on. A little bit about the ward. Um, the mental health ward in Gulu is, is a 40-bedded mental health unit within a regional referral hospital and it's for men, women and children of all ages. It serves northern Uganda and South Sudan and is an area that was particularly affected by 25 years of civil war and the devastating impact that that had on every aspect of life. 
I'm not going to go into too much detail about that, but almost every family was directed or every family knew someone who was directly affected by the war. And as a consequence of that, mental health need is, is very, very high. So our first work stream is uh, the Commonwealth Fellowship. We've had 18 people from Gulu um, come to do a fellowship scheme in Sheffield. And they've included clinical officers, nurses, psychologists, social workers, mental attendants, um, support workers who are equivalent to our healthcare assistants. And we've also had a member of the hospital administration who came specifically to learn about library management and library development. We've also had service users, we've had the chair of Mental Health Uganda and another person working in a voluntary capacity as an, as an occupational therapist. So we've had a real rich range of people that come from all aspects of, of the ward. Our second work stream is physical health monitoring. Uh, as a consequence of the patient safety aspect, we worked with the University Hospital of South Manchester to train all of the staff in the mental health unit in acute illness management. Uh, that was one of the first areas that we felt needed to be uh, developed because the people on the ward with mental health problems almost all seem to have a comorbid mental, a physical health problem, which was malaria, HIV, TB, the, the whole range. So they were having to work with physical and mental health, as, as is the case here in the UK. We also worked with a team to open um, a small dedicated occupational therapy space, which, is, which has been absolutely fantastic and is currently run by service user volunteers. And we also opened a small children's ward, again as a consequence of Commonwealth Fellowship experience here and the realisation that having children with adults was a real patient safety concern. We also observed that very large doses of medication were being given to physically compromised patients. So when we had a one of the PCO staff, who is a medical staff equivalent from the ward, here in Sheffield, he and one of our consultants developed a rapid tranquilisation protocol. That is work in progress, it's not fully established yet, but we've certainly started something going there in terms of discussions about uh, the management of patients using large doses of medication. As an offshoot, we've also worked with the wider hospital and we've had several pieces of work, but the, the main one I want to mention here, here is the development of the resource centre and hospital library. Uh, which has been very exciting because that's available to the whole of the um, hospital, all of the staff, and underpins patient safety by giving people access to tech books and resources to help them in their clinical care. We have a work stream with Mental Health Uganda, and that has been about the delivery of mental health awareness courses. This has both been in Gulu town and in villages, and is about helping people understand what mental health is and how to recognise signs and symptoms in themselves and their loved ones with an emphasis on yeah, get help, you can get help for this, you don't need to suffer in silence if you understand what it is, you can get help and support and that's been really successful and is something that we would want to roll out much, much more of in the future. We've also developed a pass a goat scheme and that's a very simple donating herds of goats which we've done through donations here in Sheffield to, uh, to villagers and when someone receives a goat and the goat has kids, the she-goats of the kids are passed on to another person in, in the village. That's been really, really successful. To own a goat in the villages is, um, gives a great sense of esteem and is, is very, very much valued. We work with three particular villages uh, through Mental Health Uganda and the villages that we work with are ones that have the highest rate of completed suicide and very high rates of, of mental illness and mental ill health. Our trust board donated bicycles in recognition of the fact that there are very, very long distances that people were having to travel um, to get to their health care. And again, that's been very successful and something we would like to, to roll out much more. And just recently, um, we've joined East London Mental Health Partnership Trust in another set uh, grant awarded project, Brain Game 2. And this is where people from different regions of Uganda 
go into Kampala and learn about peer support. Again, in, a, in recognition of the fact that there is a very, very limited community service in Kampala for people with mental health problems, but also the value of peer support, and that's about training people to become um, a, a, a peer to help them support people with, with mental health problems. And then most recently, um, the RESPECT training. This has been a long-term commitment of ours, and the partnerships has recently enabled us to expand that to the, uh, to the wider hospital because of the VET award. So what is RESPECT? Uh, RESPECT is our management of violence and aggression training that we deliver here in Sheffield. And we have been delivering this training since 2012. It has an emphasis on de-escalation and avoiding getting into situations where physical restraint is required. But if restraint is required, it has a no pain, no panic principle, which means that we don't use pain to achieve the resolution of a situation. And crucially, we don't use face down restraint here. Face down, avoiding face down restraint is national policy here in the UK and it's pivotal to patient safety because face down restraint is a position frequently associated with death. That isn't to say that other positions are safe, we know they're not, but um, face down is, is, is very dangerous. So why respecting Gulu? Our first Commonwealth Fellowship people took part in the course. They all attend the course here in Sheffield. And one of the first fellows said to us, it's like moving from wrestling to dancing. We didn't really fully appreciate the gravity of what he was saying when he said that to us, because at that time, we didn't have a full understanding of the extent of people's views about mental illness and how they managed mental illness uh, within their hospital. But once we understood that, we undertook to provide the training and we provided the entire mental health unit with the training in November 2013. Everyone on the mental health unit was trained over, over six days. And we found that some people genuinely didn't understand that it was okay to be kind and, and talk to people because of fears about mental illness and the stigma associated with mental illness. But once people uh, were engaged, they very, very quickly enjoyed the course, took part in the course, and requested that the course be made available to the wider hospital, um, to the wider staff group in, in Gulu Hospital. And so a long-term commitment began there. So a little bit about what the training is about. Um, we, there's a big emphasis on understanding the causes of violence and aggression and trying to prevent the escalation of violence and aggression. We talk a lot about the impact of stigma and how stigmatizing behavior can actually cause violence and aggression. We try to help people think about the way that uh, they see stigma and the conditions that they come to contact with in their daily work in the general hospital and how stigmatized some of those people are as well. So the, the impact of stigma and how we all sometimes may stigmatize people by our actions, helping them to identify that is a really important part of the course. We talk about the signs and symptoms of violence and aggression and the factors that can cause aggressive behaviour. And that is to help them understand that it isn't just a mental health condition. We can all get very angry and that can escalate into violence if we're not treated well or if our, the conditions, our, our needs aren't met. We talk about the crisis cycle, which is how one little thing could build up, build up, build up, and it could be a very small uh, situation that actually causes the situation to uh, come into a crisis situation, helping them to understand that they can step in very, very early. We talk a lot about de-escalation techniques and communication strategies, all about helping to talk and recognize when people are becoming upset, becoming distressed, potentially becoming aggressive. We also focus on the impact that all of this has on service users and how uh, stigmatizing behavior associated with violence and aggression has had a significant impact on their lives. And for staff to hear that directly from a service user really does have a very, very significant impact. When we can't avoid physical interventions, uh, we train people to use invent interventions that don't cause pain to be effective. We talk to them about the dangers of rapid tranquilization 
not saying that rapid tranquilization should not be used. There are absolutely the right times to use rapid tranquilization, but if you're going to use it, use it safely and physically monitor someone afterwards. So we talk about the risks and the dangers to look out for and how to monitor somebody. We also talk about positional fixia, how to avoid that, how to recognize it to avoid death. And then we talk about post-incident review and how the best learning can occur in giving everyone an opportunity to have this. So Gulu now has its own respect team. We've trained nine people there. Uh, we, repl we repl replicated the training structure that we have here. Um, and our plan is to train half of the hospital in the life of the project, which is uh, a very ambitious and very exciting and very challenging. The delivery, the co-delivery of the hospital staff's begun. We work with the trainers that we've trained when we go out there. And over time, they will get more and more um, responsibility for the delivery of the training. And we've got another course in a couple of weeks, and they will take the bulk of the uh, responsibility for delivering that training. We have had some challenges. We've had many challenges. Data collection has been a very significant one. Um, people not understanding the reason why we need to collect the data. People believing it's not their job, it's an extra job and want additional payments for it, but then also simply not having access to the materials that they need. Um, books were provided, they've gone missing, being able to get replacement books, being able to physically monitor patients, not having paper to make your recordings. Uh, there are many challenges which we're trying to work through. And communication, you know, we, we can't deny that communication has been a very difficult problem. We tried to have a Skype just this morning before here and we could not make a connection, we couldn't get Wi-Fi, we could see but we couldn't hear, uh, getting access to Wi-Fi, getting access to internet, power cuts, airtime, and lots and lots and lots of waiting. So yeah, communication is a very big challenge. We're working with an entirely new team now of people who we don't have a relationship and we're having to work very quickly and deliver very quickly and that has been a very steep learning curve. So we left them with this message. Um, be the change you want to see. Very many of them um, out there talk to us, as, as they do here, about um, not knowing what they need to do. And it's true, you don't know what you don't know. And because staff hadn't received any training, they genuinely didn't appear to know that there were alternatives to using force and pain. So the problem is, is when you know about those hard alternatives, it's actually quite hard work to put them into practice, and there is an onus on you then to put them into practice. So we have supported them to develop a sense of team and work together, and but by working together, they can make that, differ that difference in both their lives and the lives of the patients that they serve. And we very much wanted to inspire them. Um, this is the Gulu team saying hello there. And, and I can say I'm out of time, but I just want to very quickly show you some pictures. These are the Gulu, these are this, this is the mental health unit staff having done their training. And they, the seven people in that picture have been to the UK. And um, this is a picture of the children's ward, one aspect of it. And that was the opening event there by the director. Uh, this is some of our mental health awareness training that was enforced inside here by the torrential rain. And this is a picture of recipients of our pass -a goat scheme. And these are people moving forward that we want to work with in the community to, to develop patient safety in the community, so help them to recognize signs and symptoms of aggression in their loved ones so that they can keep safe and keep them safe. Thank you. That's it, Laura. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, um, it's been fascinating to hear more about your current project um, and, and the work that you're doing. That's really good. Um, I'd now like to present um, Dr. Linda Gibson, a senior lecturer at Nottingham Trent University, who will be presenting on behalf of the Macquarie University Nottingham Trent University Partnership. The partners are currently delivering the Strengthening the Community Health Worker Program for Health Improvement in Wakiso District. Um, so I'll now hand you over to Linda. Hi, Linda. Um, 
great, that's brilliant. We can we can see your slides. Um, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, hello everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking about the project that um, our partnership has been working on for the last couple of years. Um, we are a partnership that's been in existence since about 2012. Uh, we had a startup grant uh, where we did a needs assessment, um, and one of the things that we found was that um, in districts in Uganda, um, there was a big problem with the community health worker program. Um, it was very weak, and, and one thing we identified was that if we could have strengthened the community health worker program in uh, a district then uh, we would get improved health outcomes at the end, although obviously that takes a number of years to come through. But we decided to sort of pilot this work, and then if we can, uh, and we get successful outcomes, we'll scale it up for delivery and roll it out um, further. Um, it's been a partnership um, between myself and uh, David Masoki, who I know is listening in. And I, I really do have to credit, really, that um, you know the work has been delivered um, in Uganda, in Wakiso district, uh, by David and his team, who do a fantastic job. Um, I think the other thing to say is that Makarera has a long history of, um, through the university, working with um, these communities. So there was already a lot of trust built up uh, within the communities. So that was important for when we came to design the program and to for implementation as well. So the project goal is to strengthen uh, the community health worker program. And what we wanted to do, what we've designed, is um, a stronger, more structured, and more standardized training. Um, we've implemented and strengthened the supervision uh, process and uh, also provided a motivation package and we're working in Sasisa sub-county, the Kiso district uh, in Uganda, which is about 40 minutes outside of uh, Kampala on the way to Entebbe um, and it's uh, quite a rural district. The focus of the program uh, has had three elements. One is around training. Um, so we have focused on, first of all, training community health worker supervisors, uh, and then working on training community health workers. Um, supervision is really key, and, and strengthening supervision is, is really key to um, having community health workers who are able to do their work well, and, and this is an important element of the work. One of the problems that the supervisors uh, were having was just being able to get around and talk to the community health workers because it is a rural district. Transport was very, very difficult. Um, and so one of the things we've done through the project is um, provide transportation. So we have a pool of motorbikes. Uh, we bought three for the project. And supervisors can... Um, take those motorbikes out of the pool and get round the villages within their patch and therefore support the community health workers a lot better. Uh, and then motivation. Um, we found motivation to be very, a very key issue around getting people on board uh, the project and feeling uh, that the work that they're doing is valued. So um, we provide a number of non-financial incentives Things like basic things to do their work, so basic things like t-shirts, which have a logo on and make them feel uh, they have an identity and they're easily recognisable as community health workers. Um, umbrellas, gum boots for getting around in very difficult conditions, particularly when it's raining, um, and also solar equipment. And I'll, I'll talk about those a little bit more in a moment. Uh, here's some photographs, so that um, in the top left-hand corner, one of the first things that we thought was very important to do was to make sure that we got buy-in, um, and that we got buy-in from the community, we got buy-in from the health workers, 
and all the different stakeholders. So we had a big project launch, which was held in a local football ground. We got over 350 people attending that, and we also got the ministry, who are one of our stakeholders, um, attending that as well. Um, and that was a really successful day in, in really having a very strong uh, project and, and community identity. Um, at the same time, um, we'd also had um, a working party um, uh, with all the various stakeholders. Um, and this is a project team under the banner of the um, Macarera School of Public Health um, um, there. And uh, we, we did a lot of planning. We worked with the different stakeholders from the ministries, from the community health workers, supervisors, um, various health workers, and also people from, from the UK as well. Um, down on the bottom left-hand side, you can see that uh, David's actually there in the middle um, with some of the community health worker supervisors who we did the first trainings with, um, with their certificates. Um, and this was really part of what we first rolled out. We trained 24 community health worker supervisors uh, at that point. And then uh, in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see actually that's where the project team went out into the district and um, met some of the community health worker supervisors. Very, very important for um, really motivating people and, and getting people on board. And as I said, these are people who um, David and his team from Macarera have been working with um, for many years. So there's a great level of, of trust amongst that community. So um, in terms of um, some of the um, achievements that we've achieved so far, uh, we've trained 24 community health worker supervisors, and we have now um, just completed the whole training of all the community health workers. We have trained 301. Um, we provided three motorbikes, and as I mentioned, they're in the pool and very successful. I'll show you some pictures of those in a moment. And then also all the CHWs have received their um, um, motivational materials and incentives um, and, and also have certificates as they've completed their training. We also uh, provided solar equipment um, for a number of the community health workers. We did it on a sort of village basis. Um, and those solar charges are actually very, very important for um, being people being able to charge up their mobile phones, for example, because mobile phones are very important in terms of communication between the community health workers, uh, the supervisors, and, and the villagers as well. So, and where electricity is is quite unstable, that's that's quite important. And then the other thing we've done is we now have a database uh, which has been very well maintained community health workers, where they are and the kind of things that they're doing, it's been important as well. Um, so here you can see some pictures of one of the community health worker supervisors receiving a certificate. Um, in the top right-hand corner, um, some of the work community health workers getting their umbrellas, etc., and their, their gum boots. I think down at the bottom, you can see the motorbikes. So the motorbikes have been um, really helpful in terms of improving communication um, uh, between all the different people involved in the project. Um, so in terms of more achievements, um, supervisors are now really um, providing much more regular support to community health workers. Um, and this means there's a lot more consistency in their work. Um, and it also means we're collecting better data. Um, so it's more regular monthly data collection. Um, all of the people involved in the project are feeling a lot more motivated and there's a lot more commitment um, to their work. Um, and it, as I said, it's much more systematic. Um, and so there is um, a great, a great more motivation for for what they're doing, and they're feeling a lot more valued as well, which is really really important. So 
So actually by the end of January, that's January 2016, um, it means that the CHWs have, the, the community health workers have really improved the reach of, um, of their work. So they, you can see the metrics here, they've visited 9,450 households, um, they provided health education to uh, over 25,000 people and treated nearly 800 children. So actually this, um, this project has really enabled community health workers to do their work much better and, um, and also to provide um, the metrics of that. So we're very pleased with that. Some of our key learning points from the project so far. Um, certainly the use of, of local trainers. So it's not been about people coming in from outside and doing the training, but we've used local people who are known to the communities and, and have that level of trust. Um, we've involved um, a whole range of different stakeholders, including the Ministry. The Ministry of Health buy-in has been really, really important. Um, and the Minister for Health Promotion has been um, a big advocate of the programme, actually. Um, and then training of the supervisors before the community health workers, we, we feel that that worked really, really well. Getting them on board in the project um, has been a really important part of motivating the community health workers who are off, who are usually doing this work um, for very little actually and and um, uh, really need to feel valued and, and that's been really key. Uh, we developed a very simple tool for monitoring and evaluation um, that was very easy for the supervisors and the community health workers to to use and, and we'll be doing more work on on analysing some of the metrics that are coming out of the data so far. Um, and the motorbikes also um, actually are used for other health activities, so uh, also the delivery of drugs into the villages for, um, to the community health workers. And so this has enabled them to do their work much more effectively. Um, and then I think our other key learning point is that um, non-financial incentives actually have been really, really important. And I was a little bit sceptical of this to begin with because I thought, what are a few t-shirts and a few, you know, umbrellas going to do? But actually having been out there and having kind of seen the identity that these um, incentives bring to the community health workers and how that identity is really crucial uh, for motivation and, and the valuing that, that they feel um, is really, really crucial. I think it's a really big learning point. So again, here's some more um, photographs that you can see in the top left-hand corner. Um, we've got a picture of a supervisor with one of the community health workers doing, doing their work together. Um, in the top uh, right-hand corner, you can see the community health workers um, getting their solar chargers, and these have proved to be very, very popular and very, very useful. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner, you've got uh, one of the motorbikes, and they're actually it's one of the community health worker supervisors who are delivering medicines to the health centre, and that enables community health workers to do their work a lot more effectively. Um, and in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see one of the community health workers um, taking blood samples from a child in treating against uh, malaria, treating for malaria. Um, so we have to acknowledge the kind of people that we're working with, um, the partnership scheme, but also the Ministry of Health. Uh, we're also working with an organisation called um, C3, who are based in the UK, but actually have a lot of experience of working in Uganda in the community. Um, Wikiso district and the local leaders, again, they've been important to, to uh, get their buy-in um, and, and the community itself who have given us access. So that's our presentation. Thanks very much. 
Thank you, Linda. Um, your partnership has clearly achieved a lot over the past few years. It was really great to hear all about that, um, and really good to hear how well um, how you kind of went about engaging with the community um, at the beginning of the project. So our next presenter is Dr. Claire Goodhart on behalf of the Royal College of General Practitioners. Um, and Claire is the UK clinical lead for the RCGP Windy Community Hospital Partnership. Um, and the partnership focuses on strengthening the capacity of the health system in southwest Uganda to promote sexual and reproductive health. Um, so I'll now pass you over to Claire. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can we can hear you, Claire. Sure. Um can you see my screen yet? Not just um uh, yeah, that's up and running. So we can see your slides and, and, and hear you okay, so I'll hand over to you. Great. Okay, so I'm going to talk about U Shape. Um U Shape stands for Uganda Sexual Health and Pastoral Education. Um and you can see from our little icon, it's all about uh, involving men and women in this dialogue. Um, and w w it's a partnership between the Royal College of General Practitioners and a really wonderful community hospital in southwest Uganda uh, called Bwindi Community Hospital. U-shape is a great word. Uh, it means many things. And one of the things is about the shape of Uganda. And this picture shows you the shape of Uganda. Um, as you can see, it's an age sex uh, uh, diagram, but with the huge uh, numbers of young people coming through. Um, another shape of Uganda is shown in this picture, um, Uganda has the, one of the highest fertility rates in the world. And U-shape um, is all about looking at contraception and sexual and reproductive health. So now, just to put this into perspective, contraceptive use worldwide, typically in every other continent of the world, in fact, uh, contraceptive use is between two-thirds and three-quarters of uh, fertile women would be using a form of contraception. In Africa and in Uganda in particular, this is much, much lower. And in rural Uganda where we're working, um, it's down to below 20% use of contraception. And U-Shape is all about looking at this and looking at ways to um, improve positive messages about family planning. It's been calculated that if um, you unmet need for family planning were met in Uganda, Uganda would be up with the rest of the world at about 64%. So why is it that women don't use contraception? Um, and this survey shows that it's mainly to do with fear of side effects. That's the biggest reason. Um, it's a part of the world where people have had incredibly little contact with health workers and doing anything alien to your body, particularly something that might cause abnormal bleeding, is really very difficult to understand and, and people have very little confidence in it. Breastfeeding is up there as given as a reason for not using contraception and this is because uh, it's to do with uh, over-reliance on breastfeeding as a form of contraception. We know that uh, lactation amenorrhea method for uh, contraception really only works uh, for up to six months, but women continue to breastfeed hoping it will protect them um, and fall pregnant early. Now these major reasons for not using contraception are all um, amenable to good counselling. Uh, and U-Shape is all about training many, many more health workers as counsellors. Um, this is a picture of Sarah Mwezi, who is uh, the lead family planning nurse at Windy, um, and who has been a huge um, uh, person that we've been working with. Um, but it's her and her many colleagues that the program has, has been uh, trying to help in terms of training. So 
it's all about unmet need for contraception. Um, and by that, we, the definition is a woman who uh, doesn't want another child in the next two years, but is not using contraception. And we know that women in Uganda, on average, are having more than two more children than they want to have. Unmet need in Uganda is estimated overall to be about 34% of women. And in the areas we're working, our surveys have suggested that it's as high as 40% in Bwindi, and more recently we've been working in another hospital, Kasizi, and a SNAP poll in that patient showed it was 51% for women who did not want to have another child, but were not using contraception. We know that family planning saves lives. Um, it prevents maternal deaths by delaying motherhood. Um, we know that adolescents are twice as likely to die in childbirth. And uh, a major focus of U-SHAPE has been on uh, trying to outreach to young people and, and to teach them about the possibilities of family planning and contraception. Um, it also uh, saves lives by preventing unsafe for abortions. Abortion is illegal in Uganda, but is thought to account for up to 26% of maternal deaths. Um, it saves lives by allowing women to complete their families, um, and because we know that uh, older mothers who've had many, many children um, are twice as likely to die. Family planning also saves lives, but I would just say that um, a confidential inquiry at Windy has shown that 22% of maternal deaths would have been prevented by family planning. But it also saves lives by um, uh, preventing infant deaths, and uh, this is because child spacing um, helps children born in less than two years after a sibling are twice as likely to die. And again, the confidential inquiry, 20% of under five deaths were felt uh, that family planning was a major, um, would have been a major prevention. Um, so what are the missed opportunities to offer family planning? These are surveys uh, in Uganda. 77% of women um, who are not using contraception have actually never discussed it. Um, and shockingly, women who have been into a health facility after a miscarriage and indeed often after an unsafe abortion, less than, only a quarter of these are given advice about family planning to prevent the next tragedy. Um, and very few women who leave hospital after giving birth in health facilities are given family planning advice about spacing the next child. So the UCHIP uh, idea is to train across an institution and we take a whole institution approach. Um, the Cochrane review showed that advice from generic health workers is crucial to raising the profile of family planning um, and indeed uh, we are taking a horizontal approach in the project throughout. Um, we want to move away from delivery of family planning services through a sort of silo, uh, in other words, where it's just focused on you know, one family planning nurse and one family planning clinic in, in a health facility. Um, we think that it's the business of all the health workers in the facility to raise the profile. So welcome to Windy Community Hospital. Um, it's a hospital with about uh, 110 um, beds. It has a huge philosophy towards the whole community and uh, does a lot of outreach work. Um, I knew when I first visited in 2013 that this was a place that would approve of family planning approach. This is the HIV clinic, um, which doubles up as the church uh, on Sundays, and there's a rather fine message behind the altar, free family planning services available here. Um, we haven't found there to be any religious barriers. So U-Shape has um, 
develop two levels of training. Firstly, um, a basic awareness, which is works out as about five hours of training across the whole institution, and to which we invite, um, it, it, we run this course three or four times, and we invite all members of staff, including the first day, first hour, we invite managers and administrators. And then the rest of the week, for an hour a day, we invite all clinical staff. And we raise awareness across the entire institution. We then take key members of staff forward to level two training, which is 30 hours, um, another 25 hours of seminar training. Um, our aim is to uh, upskill nurses and midwives to be able to be family planning providers in their own departments, whether it's a pediatric ward or the HIV clinic, adult inpatients. Um, so level one training is very much about uh, myth busting, correcting misconceptions. We do a bit of counseling and role play. And we teach about the main methods of, of family planning that are provided. In Uganda, much the most common is injectable depot contraception. Um, and we're keen to move towards more long-acting reversible methods, implants, IUDs, and pills are all available. It's very interactive, lots of flip chart work. Typically, we'd, um, during level one training, we'd have 30 or 40 people in, in the room, um, and it's multidisciplinary. So we get people who do know clinical officers or doctors um, working in small groups with, with um, the people with less education. Level two training, this is all done in staff's own time, but despite this, and there's no um, financial remuneration, but despite this, uptake has been huge. Um, we provide this in uh, over a week in seminars, uh, small group work, case discussions, role play. Um, we have a, a highlight towards the end of the week where actually the groups develop community talks uh, for target groups like young people or adolescents or soldiers. Um, and uh, there's also a practical day uh, with lots of uh, simulated models and a chance to actually attend clinics. The practical training subsequently for insertion of coils and implants is done later on a one-to-one -one, um, for towards developing letters of competence in these techniques. But it all is very practical. So that's the training side of U-Shape, but U-Shape is bigger than that. Um, it's a, we, we think of it as in terms of a cascade of training. U-Shape um, Your Life it includes sex education and youth outreach. U-Shape Your Family is the family planning training. U-Shape Your Community is upskilling village health workers and publicity campaigns. We very much try to coordinate with um, uh, the government policy, and we believe that we have lessons that can be disseminated in other countries, so not just in Uganda. This is our cascade of training. Um, it's based on UK doctors, many GPs, um, who have volunteered um, often long term, a year at a time, um, training up uh, Ugandan tutors as trainers. And then you can see the scale of the training. The level two training is, is in service um, and, and student nurses. Village health team training, and um, we have a project with teachers as well. And they, we use people who've been trained, Ugandans who've been trained by U-Shape to run male engagement evenings, youth outreach, and work with school children. So, in summary, the aims are training more family planning providers so that they can cascade training to village health teams and teachers to pr promote positive messages about family planning through churches and schools and villages, and ultimately the aim is to reduce unmet need for family planning. Lots of challenges. Uh, 
very much the same sorts of challenges as other, other speakers have spoken of. Uh, communication is very difficult, internet is poor, um, data collection is uh, a, quite a challenge. Uh, we're trying to run a screening for unmet need uh, project, but that's definitely work in progress. Practical training, we've got to get people who've done the seminar training through to actually learning to fit implants and, and coils. But Overall, the project has really taken off um, and we're very pleased with the numbers of people who've been coming forward for this training. Um, and a lot of credit needs to be taken by our long-term volunteers. There's Claire Thomas and Kerry Gallivan out there for a year at the moment. Um, and before them, Emma King and Sarah Capewell have volunteered for, for years. Um, and we hope to move forward. Um, with the success we're getting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire, um, for a really interesting presentation. Um, it was great to hear kind of more on the context of your project and also kind of what your project's doing to address that um, and the success that you're having. So our final presentation, and just to say we are going to run slightly over um, 1 p.m., but please do um, stay with us um, if you do have any questions. Um, we hope to be finished um, not too long afterwards. So our final presentation will be from um, Andrew Fryer on behalf of the Macquarie University and the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health Partnership. The partners are currently delivering their working in partnership to improve the quality of hospital care for seriously sick and injured children and newborns in Uganda through an ETAP Plus package of training, um, which also includes ongoing support and mentorship leading to sustained changes in clinical practice. Um, so I'll now hand over to Andrew to tell you a little bit more um, about their project. Great, thank you very much. Can, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you okay. Uh, we can't see your slides just yet. Okay, can you see them now? Not at the moment. Oh, yep, yeah, we, can, we, can, we can see them now. Okay. Uh, well, I think you've given me a nice introduction, so thank you very much for that, and thank you for all the speakers that have um, come before me. Um, it's actually my second to last day today, so it's quite a nice way to sign off. One of my first days was actually at a Pet uh, Health and uh, Sharing Partnership event in, in Uganda. Uh, and as you can see, a lot of, a lot of the organizations that were at that event uh, are still there today and still delivering good work. Um, the, the college's work in Uganda uh, has originated from our emergency care training work that we've been delivering um, for around eight years in East Africa, predominantly in Kenya. And it is essentially a training intervention developed by WHO, um, but it's, it's evolved, um, hence the plus in ETAP plus, um, to, to include a little bit more of the local context and a little bit more focused on newborn care. It's implemented at hospital level and it gives professionals knowledge and skills to prioritize emergency case care and prevent deaths. Um, we were lucky enough to have quite a strong evidence base that led to the project evolving in a way that it did and evolving in a way which we think means it's more impactful. Um, and it was a prerequisite for us to have, to have a, a, a large project that we could scale up. Um, so there were studies, and you can see Mike English and uh, Grace Gamuru from the Kenya um, Pediatric Society, but also from the Kenya Wellcome Trust. And they've done quite a lot of studies, building, building on some work in Malawi um, by another one of our members, Elizabeth Molyneux. Um, and they've been able to showcase that this, this intervention um, has had an impact and to deliver long-term change. So we're able to show that it was proven um, through randomized controlled trials, um, that it was comprehensive. The training focuses on training healthcare workers, so it's not just pediatricians, but also nurses, anyone that's involved in the process, on identifying and managing the 10 most common threats to child survival. And we've taken a version of this project in Myanmar, and the, the common causes and the common uh, 
ailments, morbidity, mortality, they do vary. So in, in Myanmar, then dengue might be more prevalent. And we worked with our in-country teams in Uganda to, to look about what the local context would be and to tailor it to that. And it's, as mentioned in the introduction, it is long term. So we focus on ongoing mentorship and support as part of a collaboration between the college and the Kenyan Pediatric Association are involved. And now we've got partners in Rwanda, Uganda, and also in Myanmar. Um, so in 2011, the college was lucky enough to secure a £1 million grant from FET to deliver a multi-country partnership training program in Uganda, Rwanda, and Kenya. That was very much led by the Kenya Pediatric Society, who created a faculty of instructors. There were 18 UK RCPCH consultants that supported the project, but they did so in a quality assurance way, and they didn't really um, deliver significant training. That was led to the Kenyan Pediatric Society. And that was really much more beneficial because they were able to look at the local context and support and to really speak on a level that the partners in Rwanda and Uganda really understood. Just in the, in the graph on the bottom left, you can see some of the most common causes of um, mortality that the training focused on specifically for healthcare workers. So after the success of the three-year project, um, which ended towards the end of last year, um, we were able to secure additional funding for two years with the last round, and we continued with um, our partnership with McCary University and the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health there, and also with support from the Kenya Pediatric Society, and we looked at continuing the current project objectives, so provider training, building the capacity of our in-country partner, and continuing support supervision, so on the right you can see the country clinical lead and his deputies, on the top you've got Bob Apoka. Uh, and below you've got Deo Manubi. They've been real drivers for change. They're fantastic, talented people. Um, and not only have they helped really drive the project in Uganda, they've been involved in some of the college's emergency care training work in um, Myanmar and also in Sierra Leone. Um, and we've been very grateful for, for them to take time out of their practice as pediatricians to support the program. They've, they've really done it in, in quite um, an impressive way. Um, so there's in-service training, there's two types of training that we we'll deliver, one is in, at the hospital setting to the hospital teams, and it's a five-day course which trains the healthcare workers in that setting, uh, and we also look to build on the lessons learned from the three-year project that came before this current one. So when it came to developing the next step, um, we looked at what, having done the project for three years at Uganda, what would be the best next step? and we now had a faculty of instructors that could deliver it, um, but we really felt there were lessons learned that we could build on. So from in-country meetings that we had, and, and the Ministry of Health was involved, and I know a number of people have talked about that, and it's, it's fantastic how I, I think um, the third partnership, but generally um, the, the partners they've also chosen have really understood that as a key important part. Um, they've helped with agreeing um, guidelines, protocols, um, and also suggesting which hostel locations we should be in, um, and generally supporting the project at stakeholder meetings. Um, uh, there. Sorry, sorry, one second. This meeting's over run, so I think someone's booked the room. Could you give me five minutes? Would that be all right? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, so, um, building on from that, um, we looked at delivering the training from referral hostels to district hostels. Um, and from in country meetings from the previous project, there was a real identification that children were arriving in the referral hospitals um, from the community two or three days too late to be effectively treated and therefore it was an area that was really something that the Ministry of Health and our in-country partners and the KPA um, were quite keen to ensure that we focused on. Um, we also realized that a five-day training course for healthcare workers is quite a substantial amount of time. So from this project we've looked to have two training um, sessions over the two-year project. Um, and invite half the hostel team and then referral centers to attend the training and then say maybe 15 to attend the second training. And this has enabled us to ensure that we don't take 30 healthcare workers out of a hostel setting where obviously they're going to be needed on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we also looked at creating regional training faculties and instructors. So initially um, we had a core based in Kampala, which was fantastic, and Deo and Bob are both based there as well. And, and it's great that we had these skilled people, but we realized that if we wanted to scale up and if we wanted to really um, start bringing it to, to hospital centers further down the referral pathways, 
we needed to create faculties in the particularly different regions. Um, and so we're able to focus on that. And the, the other thing we're able to do is to combine our global linked volunteer scheme, which is a, a longer term volunteer scheme, the six to 12 months for UK pediatricians, to go and deliver um, their, their placement alongside the ETAP program. In the previous project, we have um, consultant pediatricians coming for around one to two weeks. And we found that they were really deemed as uh, inspectors. And rather than being able to drive um, and provide ongoing mentorship and support, it was deemed more as sort of the policeman coming to take the list and everyone had to sort of adapt to that. So we looked, instead of having like, those short-term visits, to have long-term um, placements from, from our members. And the Ministry of Health, um, with discussions with ourselves and the uh, Ugandan partners, Joe Six Hospitals, um, which I've crudely on a Google Drive map um, put here, um, they is essentially look to, to sort of have a north zone, an east zone, and a west zone, and choose district hospitals, um, which could be supported by the previous hospitals from the, um, the, the, pro the three-year project that was held and delivered by the Kenyan Pediatric Association with the Rwandan and the Ugandan partners. And so the district hospitals that you can see a few pictures here, you can see that the, the hospitals are quite run down. A lot of them are built um, in exactly the same style and that they have issues with triage and, and healthcare workers um, delivering the appropriate treatment at times. And so our Ugandan partners, Bob and Dave, have visited all six hospitals that have been chosen in this project and spoken about the ETAP training and explained how um, the previous project worked and how they would be receiving support from, from them and also from regional teams. So we're looking at capacity building and then follow up mentorship and support. We're looking at to having hospital champions and global links volunteers delivering continual medical, continue medical education um, to promote job aids and guidelines that have been approved at national level. Um, we're looking at improving and setting up a triage system and we supply a small amount of funds to give the right amount of equipment or layout alterations to ensure that the principles in the training can be delivered out. Um, we have support of medical school, so there is student training, there's eight student courses as part of this program and that's really to ensure that when uh, students are coming into the hospital settings, they're already familiar with the key concepts of the program. And as I mentioned before, we're looking to combine it with the Global Links volunteer scheme. And on the right, you can see Jean Boyer, who was our first um, Global Links volunteer and ECAT consultant in the old project. And her experience at FOIMA, where she was really able to deliver more substantial and sustainable change, um, was uh, led to the, the, the combination of the two programs. Um, so each volunteer will be working one of the district hospitals. Um, a lot of their work will be clinical support, so they will get some practice, they will join the teams. But they're also looking to, to where possible to agree hospital objectives they work with a hospital champion with to, say, improve medical records, data collection, um, lead and encourage clinical audits, and to do some training on resuscitation skills, observations, and prescribing. Um, we, we weren't able to recruit volunteers as early as September, but we have had volunteers, four volunteers leave in January, and already they've started to sort of work on these um, uh, training sessions in CME, and it's great to hear that um, in, in hospitals that really could uh, use the additional support, they've managed to fit in quite quickly, um, which is something that previous Global Links volunteers have had issues with. Um, we also look at, um, as I mentioned before, the layout, um, guidelines, hygiene, um, equipment, lab services, emergency drugs, antibiotics, and consumables. And this is an example of the data collected in the old project, but it, it's, it's just to sort of give an example. We're looking at improving these areas as much as possible and have the, the regional um, instructors support the hospitals, but also the hospital champions and the volunteers look to see where possible to improve these areas of the hospital. So, so far the project has um, collected um, and designed data tools which have been agreed. Um, in, in this project, um, to try and support most of the team, data clerks have been um, recruited um, to help with the data they collection. There is a lot of data that is, is collected, um, but trying to keep it in a, in a good um, uh, way to be stored and to try and report back on it has been a challenge that the team's really focused on quite strongly. Um, ETAC training has occurred in the six hospitals for the first round, and they'll be looking to deliver the second round within the next six months. 
So far, three ETAT student courses have been delivered, and we've, as I mentioned before, had four Global Links volunteers who've been deployed in three hostels um, chosen by the Ministry of Health. The challenges we face um, is staff attrition. Um, it's, it's natural that you're going to get healthcare workers moving from one hospital to another. Um, and by having two um, ETAP courses per hospital, we look to try and um, deal with that particular problem we had in the previous project. Drug stockouts is still a major problem that we face. Um, having the right um, drugs available in at key cases is still something that we're struggling with. But we're using the in-country meetings to really try and um, explain the situation and try and lobby to an extent with the Ministry of Health to ensure that, where possible, those drugs are being delivered to the hospitals where it's needed. Um, there's competing priorities. We're aware of the hospitals have different NGOs coming and, and working there. And part of our aim is to try and find out who they are and to try and share where possible. Um, sustainability issues is, is a key one. We're looking to try and um, uh, deliver the program on a more scaled up version after the two year project. And, and finding a way to do that is something that um, will, will be a key challenge to the team. Uh, lack of involvement in the community. So I mentioned before that we moved down to district level hospitals. And that was really because at community level, um, it, we realized that there was. Uh, an issue with either the, the, the geography of getting um, a newborn, for example, to the hospital, or the understanding that this was perhaps the best thing to do at that particular time. And uh, separate to this project, one of our Global Links volunteers is running a project in, in the community in Chinja, which focuses on this particular issue. Um, so becoming more involved in the community is something that we're really looking to focus on. Um, I mentioned volunteer recruitment. Um, it's getting um, a, a large number of volunteers um, for, for the project has been a little bit more challenging. Um, we now currently have four, um, but it is something that we're, when it comes to recruiting, it kind of goes in peaks and troughs, so that can be difficult to imagine. Um, and concern over data collection, this is just, um, and it was raised in, in a health partnership meeting in Uganda, it's a concern that project managers and healthcare workers and, and nurses and doctors who are, are collecting the data um, it's a concern they have about what happens to this data when it's reported out the line. And will there be a consequence to that? So there is a sensitivity about that, and we have tried to deal with it. Um, I think I'm just about to be kicked out of this room, so um, I'll say thank you um, now, and I'll try and move and, and take questions out there. Sorry, it's overrun a little bit, so um, no. yeah, apologies. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, it's really interesting um, to hear all the work you're doing on, on ETAP Plus. Um, and also um, the learning that you've gained over the years and, and how you've incorporated that into your partnership going forward. Um, we've had some excellent examples um, today of the fantastic variety of work that's being delivered in Uganda. Uh, much of this fulfills what we consider at FET to be the principles of partnership, um, or more informally, oh, the POPs here at FET. And the speakers today have clearly shown how these are translating into success for the partnerships and their projects. If you haven't visited our website yet to explore these eight principles further, please do so. Um, we've also started blogging about issues related um, to the principles of partnership and examples um, of principle of partnerships working, so please keep an eye on our blog page too. I'm wary that we, we've run over, um, but we would like to take a few few minutes to provide enough time um, for, for questions if anyone has any um, and I hope the presenters can stay with us but if you do have to um, pop off then, then that's no problem. So there are, there are two ways which you can ask any questions. If you have a microphone on your setup you can raise your hand so there's a little, should be a little yellow button, hand button that you can see. Um, we'll then invite you to speak and unmute you. Alternatively, you can type the question in um, and we'll have a look through our question pane and read some of those aloud and try to answer them. So I'll just, um, panellists, if you're also there, I'm also just going to unmute all of you. So if you have any comments on each of those presentations or things you'd like to discuss while we just look through the, um, the question panes, then please go ahead. 
we'd like you to ask a question for, from Sheffield. Yeah, please. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Greg Harrison. I work very closely with, with Kim. We were particularly interested in some of the points raised by, by Linda. Uh, one was the buying and the use of motorbikes and and the solar uh, and the solar chargers uh, and we were just wondering if they were bought with a grant from FET. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes we can. Hi, yes, um, thank you for the question. Um, yes we did, we, we bought them as part of the um, materials for the project. I mean, we did have you know, a number of conversations with FET around this um, and you know, sort of about the legitimacy of, of buying these materials, etc. Um, but yeah, they were bought as part of the project. But um, they will be, you know, uh, after the life of the project, they will still be there in the community to be used. So we felt that, you know, in terms of the motorbikes, um, they're quite a big investment, but they are something that will continue um, to be carried on uh, and be useful beyond the life of the project. Sure. Okay. Thank you for that. Also, I'd just ask what. One more thing, Linda, is about mm. we're particularly interested in what you're saying about a simple tool for monitoring and, and evaluation. Um, yes. Obviously, verbally, it's difficult to to describe much, but um, yeah. if it was possible that we could access that and see it, we'd be really yeah. interested. Uh, yeah, we, sure. We, as Kim worked what was saying we we do a lot of work uh, both with the hospital in, in Gulu and mm -hmm. and the service user group and trying to find appropriately simple tools for monitoring uh, and evaluation. I think we found fairly challenging, really. Okay, so it, yeah, it, definitely. I'll talk to um, David. I think David's online. I'm not sure whether he can hear this. I think he probably can. Um, I'm not sure whether he can come in on the chat or not, but um, I mean, he and his team have, have kind of developed that tool. Are you there, David? David's muted. Oh, uh, David's muted. Okay, that's fine. Um, but um, I'll talk to David, and I'm sure that you know we can send it through to you. That would be a problem. Um, Thank you very much. Hello. Hello, David. Hi, David. If you have a response that you to say. The line is brilliant. Okay. Anyway, I can I can talk to David and um, you know get that organised for you. Thank you. Okay. And I enjoyed hearing about your project. I think one of the great things about this whole event is about the learning we can have from each other. And, and I picked up a couple of things that I thought from your presentation. Um, one was around the use of Commonwealth Fellows and the other was around safety safety aspects but I thought the things that you know gave me pause for thought to think about how we might think about those ideas within our project. So um, I'd probably be contacting you as well at some point. So That'd be great, yeah do, please. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Great. Um Claire, did you I see you've typed a question through. Did you want to I think Andrew is still with us. Yes, it's a specific question about um, accreditation of training. Um, we ha also have huge attrition of health workers um, because where the rural hospital where I work, health workers, it's a great place to work, but people tend to stay for uh, one to three years and then move on. And what I really think is that this can be used in a positive way uh, with people taking their training to their next health facility that they're going to work in. But we're having some difficulty achieving government accreditation of U-shaped training. And my question is, how does ETAT, does ETAT have uh, some sort of accreditation when uh, um, staff have been trained, which they can take forward to the next hospital? And if so, how do they achieve that? Uh, hi there, can you hear me? Yep, we can. Yes. Okay. Okay, excellent. I, I, I've got um, I've 
different room. I've got slightly different headphones, so the line wasn't particularly good. Then I think I answered the question. So if if I didn't, then um, please repeat the question. Um, we the, the way that it works, it follows the Kenyan Pediatric Association model. So they they initially um, delivered a training course to our partners, which was the um, uh, the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at McCary University. As, as part of the sort of quality assurance on, on that, they then would um, observe a number of training courses delivered by the chosen faculty of instructors from Uganda. Um, when it comes to accreditation, the in-country partner would provide that. So in Kenya and Rwanda, it's the Pediatric Association. In Uganda, because it wasn't with the Uganda Pediatric Association, but with McCary University, they do get a certificate and they do get some form of accreditation. Uh, I, it's it's not um, from the Ministry of Health, although the Ministry of Health do recognise and support the training programme, but it is from the Department of Pediatrics um, uh, and Child Health at McCary University. So if they do go to a, a different hospital, um, then they can show that they've done that training and, and show uh, that they have accreditation, but it's it's not at this stage um, accredited with Ministry of Health um, uh, accreditation, if you like. And are you interested in looking for that? Because maybe we could join forces and, and uh, perhaps DFID might help in terms of uh, actually finding government accreditation. Because Unless you actually get government accreditation, I don't think it will have an effect on people's promotion prospects or their, their um, earning uh, ability. Yeah, I, I think that would be an, an excellent idea. There's an in-country meeting um, that my colleague Pete Nash will be going to in um, two weeks' time. So I'll mention firstly this to him and secondly um, just to follow up with yourself after that because I do think it's a good idea and we we do think um, that if we could get that, it would be very helpful. And in addition to that, we'd really like to move to a situation where uh, the undergraduate courses were part of the national curriculum. And that, that's quite a tricky thing to do, but they have managed to, to have some success with that in Kenya. Um, so if, if we could replicate that in Uganda, it would be fantastic. Yeah, it would be great to, to join forces on this. Okay. Great, thank you. We have... Um, one hand up, so we'll just go to someone on the line who who has a question. Um, actually, someone from within there. It's Ben. Um, hi there. Um, well, I think it's unmuted now, so able to ask a question. Oh, I think it's me. I'm Louise. I'm using Ben's login. My apologies. Hi. I'm Louise McGrath. I'm the <laughs> I'm the head of programs development. So hello everyone. We haven't I haven't had the opportunity to meet any of you in person, but um, I just wanted to flag up that, as some of you may be aware, we're actually going to be setting up an in-country presence in Uganda exactly to support partnerships like, like yours. And the, the issues you've raised about, for example, accreditation, that's the kind of issue that we would certainly be very keen to work with you on trying to take forward. So we're in the process of setting up at the moment, um, and the person that will be leading the program is only able to provide ad hoc support in the, in the first few weeks. But we hope that um, certainly towards the end of this month we'll have you know we'll be able to start to, to look at a more structured presence in country and be able to provide support to some of these key issues as well as providing some um, logistical and administrative support to your operations in country and supporting this um, the, the, the cross learning amongst the, the partnerships as you say there's so much that you're learning from each other so we'd be very keen to facilitate that that's fantastic to hear actually and uh, I should look forward to that Excellent. Great. Thank you, Louise. But are we Pardon? thinking of based? Pardon? Where are you thinking that you're going to be based? Because it does sound excellent. Where do you think you will be? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, we'll have a presence in Kampala to begin with, but obviously the the the, the, the person that will be running this will be you know, aiming to provide support to all of the partnerships. So the nature of this and what that will actually um, include will depend very much on an assessment of the needs that you all identify as being the priorities. But the key aim of this in-country presence is to, to really facilitate um, you know, alignment and supporting you to link in with key national priorities and, and vice versa, but also to address some of these key issues which are um, either hampering the delivery of your programs or which by addressing will really enable you to take the programs further forward. So. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to add value to the, the excellent work you're all doing. 
sorry if you're um, sorry if you're repeating the point. Um, when was um, when was that position be starting? Well, the person start, the, the person can only start full time from May, so that's obviously a bit later than we'd we'd hoped. But okay. he's already in country on an ad hoc basis. He's based elsewhere for for some of the time, but is already going to be starting to have some initial discussions. And I, in fact, had a, a call with him this morning to agree that I would be sending out a communication to all the HPS partnerships to let you know about this. But as I'm on this this um, this webinar now, I thought I'd just mention it quickly because I think there are so many points that you raise which having the in-country principal be able to support. No, I agree. That'd be, that would be great. Fantastic. How many of the presenters are going to be at the learning and sharing um, workshop that SET are organizing? And if so, could we have a Uganda focus group there? At the moment, how, how many of you um, will be attending, but it's definitely something um, we, we can follow up, um, follow, up, yeah. follow up and, and have a think about it. Um, and we've got a couple of people on, on our um, question panel writing that they, they will be at the sharing and learning event, so I think it's definitely something that we can, we can follow up after this webinar um, and make sure that kind of details are shared. Um, we just had one question, if we could uh, share, are you able to, to say a couple of minutes just to ask one question um, from an attendee called Edward, um, who's just asking a bit more about the family planning trainings um, that you've delivered and whether you developed a curriculum um, or had thought about an e-learning component to the course. Um, yes. So. Uh, we have uh, got really quite developed materials, including a curriculum and a facilitator's guide. Um, it's interesting, the issue about e-learning. We have uh, sourced good e-learning through global health e-learning. There's also another package um, developed in Ethiopia. Um, and we've encouraged our trainees to do the e-learning either before or alongside the seminar level two learning. Our experience has been that Ugandans are not very keen on e-learning even when there is internet access. Um, we've had more success when, when training students because they had iPads and were able to, we were able to insist that they did e-learning. Um, but we, we found that generally you can tend to prefer the seminar and the discursive learning. Okay. Uh, our results are incidentally very soon going to be published on our website. Right? Um, but if people want them before, I'm very happy to share them with anybody. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, we might um, put, put you in touch with um, Edward after, after this this webinar. So I think as we're we're nearing half one now, um, it's uh, we'll, we'll have to draw the webinar to a close. Um, please do feel free to get in touch with any feedback you have on this session, um, as well as any ideas you may have for our future webinars in this series. Um, our next webinar will focus on monitoring and evaluation and learning. Um, which we know is um, and will be held on the 20th of April, sorry, not the 15th, the 20th. Um, so I hope you can join us then. Uh, I think it will be a popular one. And for today, we'd just like to thank all those who registered very much for attending our webinar today. Um, and to thank all the panellists. Um, it's been great hearing about all the work you've been doing um, and possible areas for collaboration. So we hope it's been of interest to everyone. Um, and that's it for today.